I'm here with uh, Ben Chapel from the Narrow Band Channel, and uh, I thought I'd take this opportunity to talk about uh, specifically what OM systems can do to improve or make these cameras much more attractive to astrophotographers because it's definitely a huge and growing field. I don't think we're talking about anything too complicated uh, for OM systems to be the camera brand to go to when it comes to astrophotography. The astrophotography segment, it's, it's the only segment that's growing. You look at every other segment, whether it be portraiture, wedding photography, street photography, macro photography, all of those other segments are getting gobbled up by the cell phone. But when somebody gets into astrophotography, the first question they ask is, not what cell phone am I going to buy? <laughs> you know, that's like the farthest thing from their mind. This demographic is the most cell phone proof, if you want to put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, demographic that is searching for a camera and uh, often like a camera like one of these this is something you would buy that you would still be able to use for terrestrial photography but you know you could take a long ways in astrophotography yeah and I, th I think a really good example we mentioned this I think maybe in another video about ZWO just a few years ago nobody heard of them but they were doing such a great job now they've exploded in the astrophotography market and I think uh, OM systems you know, within the astrophotography world, it's commonly known that these are great cameras for astrophotography, but there are certain things that I think like ZWO may have, do, have done is if they just really just add a few tweaks, uh, this can be, you know, explosive in that community. Uh, so I'm going to ask Ben what those tweaks would be, and we'll start with uh, maybe just on the firmware side or things that can be done maybe to most of the cameras. So first, we'll talk about stuff that can be done in firmware. Okay. And firmware is is kind of fun to talk about because there's so many things that could be done mm -hmm. i know you last night you were using your lumix s right right and it has a red mode for using it at night to that kind of preserve your your, your right. dark adoption so it turns the screen and the evf red yeah to preserve your night night vision and that that's that's quite the luxury and it's such a simple little thing red dark adoption is, is pretty critical actually for a lot of people that are taking their camera to star parties, especially mm -hmm. where no white lights are allowed. Yeah. And I definitely it, noticed when I changed the, I did some, uh, I, well, I attempted some Milky Way stuff with the Lumix camera and I changed the viewfinder to red mode and oh my goodness, it was like literally night and day difference mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to, to my night vision because when I had it in normal, it was like just almost blinding to look at it. Then I turn it to red and I can still see the screen clearly and my night vision around me was still preserved and I wasn't falling over stuff. Yeah. And then there's, there's crazy little things that like, it seems like every manufacturer has like a couple little things that they do well that are great for astrophotography, but there isn't a whole encompassing package. Like for example, when we talk about, was it Fujifilm? Yeah. Their built-in intervalometer, I mean, you can do five-minute exposures yeah, it's with like, the built-in intervalometer. If, if there's a limit at all, I haven't tested it. But yeah, you yeah. can go a long time on a on built-in intervalometer. Whereas with these guys, you know, we're limited to 60 seconds, which which is good. That's actually kind of kind of in the middle ground for the market, but still, that's way too, woefully too short for astrophotography. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if you could do five, ten minutes in camera, uh, that would be just another thing. Or box to check, mm -hmm. yeah, an yeah, easy right. one to check for astrophotographers. They're gonna like, yeah, get the Olympus. It has the night vision. It has the ten minute intervalometer. Okay, so those are two main things yeah. that can be easily done. Is there anything else? Uh, dithering, dithering in an astrophotography we have a saying: you know, dither or die. You know, you, a lot of astrophotographers would rather die than not be able to dither their images. Mm -hmm. And what dithering does is it, is it every single picture it moves the sensor around a little bit so that the hot pixels that show up in our sensors are randomized and spread out throughout the image and they don't like build up over time. And mm. dithering is, is, I know when I first started doing dithering and with my, with my model cameras and of course I piggyback these cameras and dither that way, but that means I, I lose a frame every once in a while because if it dithers during an exposure, of course it messes up that exposure. Right. But you know, I capture the frames in between. But yeah, dithering really does a lot to reduce noise. So is that when you say this could be a firmware type thing? Yeah, so this would be what, firmware. What would what would the firmware do to make this camera dither? So what we would be is in the intervalometer, you would probably have an option that would allow you to dither, and you would say, "I want to dither by so many pixels." In other words, that's how many pixels the sensor will move, mm. and then <clears throat> how often you want to dither. Like you want it to dither every single picture. You want it to dither every two or three pictures, and 
And that I see. easily can be accomplished with the image sensor stabilization okay. that we have built into these cameras. You know, it's just it's just a writing of a little bit of code. And it's actually wonderful that we have a built-in in the long run in the yes. first place. Yes. Some cameras don't have it at all. And having it built in means one less piece of hardware, one less point of failure. And, you know, it, it puts it in the camera. Because really, making making the cameras more friendly or, like, desirable is all about putting more features into something. Right. You know, the more hardware, the more external hardware that you can eliminate, uh, the, the more desirable it will be to people. But I think overnight, we can get the red screen and time limit change. change yeah. Right? Yeah, for sure. And the dithering part, certainly over with a little development time, it can be added pretty easily. Uh, what else? Because we're not talking about trying to blend, or you're talking about blending the dithered images too? Yeah, so that's done when you stack your images. Okay, so you would take, uh, you would have two separate images slightly, just slightly off by a pixel mm -hmm. or so. Okay, so yeah. the Which camera is... itself doesn't have to stack the two images together. Yeah. Although that would be really cool to see, <laughs> to see stacking. All right. Well, we kind of have it. We kind of have yeah, it. Yeah, we have live it. Comp mm -hmm. and live bulb and all that stuff. That, yes. That's sort of. And high res shot mode. And... Yeah, but those, those are usually what's called average uh, slumming. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whereas like, like stacking is just a little bit different. Basically, it's just changing the statistics behind the stacking algorithm. It's, it's really not too difficult to do. If you, if you had all these things that we've just talked about, mm -hmm. I mean, right there, you would have a camera that basically you would go from start of your imaging session to a finished product that you could post to Instagram right away. Wow. And you could do it all within the camera. Wow. Um, if you had like the ability to stack your images so with something mm -hmm. similar to live comp or live bulb. If you combined all of these things, and this is all firmware related, and then maybe with a little bit of time add on the dithering, oh my God, you would have like probably, you know, I can't even guess what a huge market would be looking at this camera and lens systems. And that's all it takes is that little spark sometimes, just like uh, the ZWO system. It just takes a little spark. You do everything right. Uh, you can go really far. So are there any other firmware type things you think that would work? Um, um, not that I can think of like right minute, but I'll tell you a little success story. So like mm -hmm. uh, for years, the Canon Rebel T3s, were considered the camera to buy if you were getting into astrophotography. Mm -hmm. And that one reason was because a an open source project called EOS, Astro EOS, I think it is, mm -hmm. it's basically just software that controls the camera for astrophotography. Mm -hmm. It worked with that particular camera. Mm -hmm. And so it made that camera incredibly popular. And, and it was yeah. also pretty easy to uh, to make it hydrogen alpha sensitive by removing the UV arc. So we'll talk about that a okay. little bit. All right. But yeah, that's that's another thing is so like companies like ZWO mm -hmm. and of course there's back there's Nina is another very very popular piece of software that mm -hmm. runs on the computer. Um, a couple other pieces of software out there that I could think of uh, would be Backyard EOS and uh, Astroberry. These these uh, a lot of them are open source projects, so they're just mm. kind of done by people with time. But if Olympus was to cooperate with them and offer them the SDK and the and the communication protocols with the mm -hmm. cameras, these could be implemented into that kind of software and, and then you would have plug and play solutions because right. a lot of times we, we like to control the cameras externally from like a computer that's in the house or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's very, very popular in astrophotography is, mm. is being able to control and bring all these different elements together to software. So so let's talk about a little bit of hardware. Yeah, so, there would, so <laughs> let's say we get all of that what else can we do? We have to go to hardware, right? Yes, so, so hardware changes. Um, every camera has a UV IR cut filter in them. And typically to balance it with what we see with our eyes in the daytime, they cut off the red, okay, short. Now in astrophotography, there's a section of red that's actually pretty deep into the red. It's called a hydrogen alpha band. And this is where you get people talking about modified cameras. And I know Olympus, or I'm sorry, Canon and Nikon both have, in the past, they come out with specialized cameras that right. didn't have a UV IR cut filter on them. The A version or something. Yeah, that usually there is the A version Astro is what it usually stood for. And and really, there's a, a much simpler solution to getting around it is you just make one UV IR, IR cut filter that works for both daytime and astrophotography. And all you have to do is have a very small opening 
in UV IR cut filter right where that hydrogen band is mm. in, the, uh, in the spectrum. And that will give you a massive, massive boost of sensitivity. I mean, uh, like a camera like this could easily beat something with a sensor much, much larger just because it had like hydrogen alpha sensitivity. Interesting. So it's kind of like a notch filter in audio. You would have a notch filter for mm -hmm. uh, light. It would basically be a, just a new UV IR cut filter okay. that would have, you know, your typical opening for all your typical broadband mm -hmm. daylight type imaging, and then just have a small sliver there out in the deep red. Interesting. Because, like I think this guy right here, like it only detects about thirty three percent of hydrogen alpha that hits it. Ah. So if you, th you think about it, that's a three x loss of light is reflected, and that is probably the biggest single thing that would get somebody to buy your camera over somebody else is if it had open an open gate for hydrogen alpha. These, these are the kind of things like when people are looking at camera systems as, as new buyers to into the system, they're not currently, they don't currently own any system. You know, we need to check every box that we can. And if your next camera has this one additional thing, uh, it's going to get so much hype. I Everyone's think. going to run to it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's one of the challenges with the camera industry today, I think. And this is a whole different topic I might get into another video, but it's generating new customer bases because you think about the cameras that were just released, the, the G9 II, the GFX 100, mm -hmm. and I forget the other one. But uh, it's like, these are not cameras that somebody brand new in the photography is going to buy. <laughs> like, these are not new customers. These are existing, you know, customers, generally speaking. And so we need to be more creative. And I think astrophotography is probably the most untapped area of, of every camera manufacturer. Here's another thing is, mm -hmm. that, is that the, the demographic, the people that are getting into astrophotography are younger people. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went to NEFLES last year, which mm -hmm. was the, it's a trade show basically dedicated to astronomy. First off, the majority of people that are there were there for astrophotography gear. Right. And also, all of the people that were there for astrophotography here were younger people. Like we're talking like thirties, forties and younger. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go to like a nature wildlife or any other kind of photography conference, mm -hmm. it's going to be an older population. So um, Ben, thanks so much for uh, taking the time uh, to explain all of that because uh, we, we both love this system for, for many reasons uh, beyond astrophotography. And we really want, we really think this is a, a missed opportunity. Uh, that would just be very simple to do. So thanks again, and uh, we'll see everyone again soon.